Hey everybody, this is a lecture on electrostatics. That's the study of uh, basically electricity that's not really moving much. Um, and this lecture is on the or electric charge and electric forces. We're going to talk about the origins of charge and finding the total amount of charge in a substance. We're going to talk about Coulomb's law, which tells us the electric force between two charges at some distance. We'll talk about conductors versus insulators, and we'll talk about methods of charging objects and transfer of charge. There will not be any problem solved in this lecture. There should be an accompanying problem set lecture that goes with this. Let's get started. Uh, so first of all, uh, electric charge is this fundamental property of matter. The symbol we use for electric charge is Q. Could be capital Q, could be lowercase q. Same as the variable for heat, but in this unit we're using it for charge. Uh, the unit for electric charge is the Coulomb, and the variable, or the abbreviation for Coulomb is capital C. There are two types of charge, positive charge and negative charge. And it's kind of arbitrary that we call them positive or negative, but the math ends up working out with positive and negative. Uh, basically, if we have two like charges near each other, they will repel each other. Positive and positive repel, negative and negative repel each other. Unlike charges or opposite charges attract each other, so they'll feel a force that pulls them towards each other, kind of like gravity. And neutral particles uh, don't feel any electric force at all. So let's go back to chemistry a little bit and talk about the origin of electric charge. All matter, at least matter that we deal with in everyday life, is made of atoms, and an atom has two parts, a nucleus, which is uh, made of a bunch of protons and neutrons that are bound together. Protons have positive charge, neutrons have no charge, and protons and neutrons are quite massive and they're bound to each other in the nucleus. Electrons uh, are basically orbiting-ish around the nucleus in the electron cloud, and they're very light, they are negatively charged. Um, the amount of charge on a proton is opposite the amount of charge on an electron, and that's actually the smallest amount of charge that can exist in nature. So this is going to be a fundamental constant of physics and chemistry. It's called the elementary charge. The variable that we give to it is lowercase e. And lowercase e is 1.60 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. If we're talking about a proton, uh, the charge is positive E. If we're talking about electron, the charge is negative E. If we want to find the total charge in something, we just add up all the protons and electron, add up all the individual charges. So we could say Q total, or Q net, is equal to the number of excess protons, or excess electrons, times the elementary charge. For example, if we have three extra, or sorry, uh, three more protons than electrons, we would do three times positive E to get Q total. We just plug in our value for lowercase e here and calculate it out. Uh, we already stated that electric charges feel forces from other electric charges. Um, and we call this force either the Coulomb force as in this guy's name, Coulomb, or the electric force, the force between any two charges or charged objects. We know it's attractive between opposite charges, repulsive between like charges, and this is our equation for Coulomb's law. F equals K Q1 Q2 over R squared, where K is a constant of nature. It's 8.99 times 10 to the 9 Newton meters squared per Coulomb squared. It's called Coulomb's constant, or the Coulomb constant. Uh, Q1 and Q2 are the two charges. We sometimes write them as big Q and little q. And R is the distance between the centers of charge of the two charges. And we want to stick with meters in order to cancel out with the meters in the Coulomb constant. Uh, by the way, this Coulomb constant, 8.99 times 10 to the 9, um, actually, I think that might even be wrong. I think it's 9.00 uh, times 10 to the 9. But I'm might be wrong about that. Most of the time in calculations we can just use 9 times 10 to the 9 though. 
uh, that error is going to be quite small. The relationship between force and the product of the two charges is direct. So the stronger one charge is, the stronger the force is. The stronger the other charge is, the stronger the force is. The stronger the product, the stronger the force. Double one charge, the force will be doubled. Double both charges, and the force will be quadrupled, because it's times two and times two again. The re relationship between force and distance is an inverse square law, which means if you double the distance, the force will be one quarter as large, because uh, you're multiplying the distance times two, the force is divided by two squared. Divided by two squared is one fourth. Triple the distance and the electric force will be one ninth as large. One over three squared. Uh, make sure you have this equation written down and all of your constants and variables written down. The electric force always acts on a straight line between the two charged objects. Uh, always draw the force on the object you're talking about, like a free body diagram, as always. For example, Q1 and Q2 are attracted if we're identifying the force on Q2. It feels an attractive force towards Q1. That arrow represents our attractive force. This is the force on 2 on Q2 from Q1. And that's what that notation here means, force on 2 from 1. Um, we could also draw the force on one from two, and since it's also attractive, it's going to be pulled directly towards uh, Q2, so we would call that the force on one from two. And those forces have to be equal by Newton's third law of motion. They both feel equal forces. The electric force is a field force or an action at a distance force, uh, which means the charges don't have to be in contact. Uh, this force acts at a distance just like gravity. Uh, notice our equation for the gravitational force is quite similar to our equation for the electric force. Gravity is some constant times the two, product of the two masses over r squared. Our electric force is also some other constant times the product of the two masses over r squared. So all of our calculations are going to be quite similar um, to our gravitational calculations. Uh, some of the differences are gravity is only attractive while the electric force can be attractive or repulsive. And the electric force is much, 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 much stronger than gravity. For an electron and a proton, the electric force is, now my numbers might be a little off, but I believe it's about 10 to the 29 times stronger than the force of gravity. Uh, so that's, that's one with 29 zeros after it times stronger than the force of gravity. Gravity is very, very, very weak. Uh, because this force, electric force, is a vector, just like any force, we use the principle of superposition to find the net force. If there are more than two charges, the net electric force uh, is found by just getting the vector sum of all the electric forces. So if we can identify all the individual forces, we can find the net force. So we're going to draw all forces directly on the charge that you're finding the net force on. Um, and then we are going to find the net force like a vector. If our forces are in the same direction, they're the same sign, so they're added. If they're in opposite direction, they're subtracted. But we want to be careful about direction in all cases. Um, so let's find the net force on charge C. Well, A and C are opposite charges, so C is going to be attracted to A, which is why we have this little force on C from A here. B and C are also opposite charges, so they're also going to attract. But since B is closer, that force is going to be larger. So we have a larger leftward force. In fact, it's four times as strong. And we get these two forces. The net force is just this plus this. We would calculate each of these individually using Coulomb's law. Um, K, this would be Q, C, Q, B over the distance between C and B squared. And then we do the same thing down here. This is our net force. Down here, uh, A and C are attracted, same as before. There's our force on C from A. B and C are repelled. So there's our force on C from B. It points to the right, and it's a lot stronger. So we would do 
uh, calculate these forces and then subtract them because they're in opposite directions. Subtract the magnitudes, that is, FCB minus FCA. Same as any old vector or force problem. If we have two-dimensional charges, we can solve two-dimensionally as we always could. Um, add up all the x's, add up all the y's, and get the resultant. If we want to find the force on B, B is attracted to A, and it's repelled by C. So we could find the force on B from A, and it points straight down. The force on B from C points straight to the left. So the net force, well, I'm actually going to draw it out. We know our net force is the vector sum. To add vectors, we connect them tail to tip. So this is F, B, A, this is F, B, C, and this is our resultant F net on B. So we're trying to solve for F net on B. This is a right triangle, so the uh, magnitude is just, use the Pythagorean theorem to solve that. And to get the direction, We just use the inverse tan of y over x. Um, that's going to give us one of these angles here, this one or this one. Um, and we just need to correctly identify the angle, and we'll be able to find our angle, same as, same as any time. I think in that case it gives this angle, and that'll allow us to state the direction. OK, so. Uh, one important fundamental fact about electric charge is it cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transferred from one place to another. Um, the net charge in the universe is a constant. We can never have, uh, well, we also think the net charge is zero, but we can never create more charge out of nothing. Um, that's an important fundamental fact. Also, in our everyday lives, it's only the electrons that can easily be transferred from one object to another. It's because the protons and neutrons are fixed to each other in the nucleus, and they're very massive, so they aren't free to move. While electrons are very light, they're very far away from the nucleus, they're not fixed, they're free to move. So it's the negative charge that flows from one place to another. We can also break down materials uh, based on how they transfer charge from one place to another. Conductors are materials that transfer electrons easily. Electrons can flow through them freely. Metals are conductors, at least most metals are, which is why they're used for circuitry, lightning rods. Insulators are materials that don't easily transfer electrons, like, well, glass, plastic, rubber, or air. Um, notice that electrical conductors and electrical insulators are pretty similar to uh, thermal conductors and thermal insulators, and that's because if electrons can transfer easily between or through a material, that means they can transfer heat easily from one place to another in a material. So there is a lot of overlap, but they're not always exactly the same. These are electrical conductors and insulators. There's also semiconductors, which have properties in between conductors and insulators. Some metalloids are semiconductors, and these are really important in um, computing, in building transistors, because uh, we can set them up so that we can control when they conduct and don't conduct, which is the basis of uh, all modern computing. There's also a special type of material called a superconductor, which if you pull, or which if you cool them to below a certain temperature, they conduct perfectly without any loss of energy, without any resistance to the flow of electricity. Uh, we also need to mention this device called an electroscope. It's a device used to detect nearby charged objects, and it works because metals are conductor. So an electroscope is usually just some metal object, some metal pan or some metal ball that's attached to a couple of other metal objects that can move. They're nearby, nearby each other and they can move. If we bring a negatively charged object near the metal, the electrons will be repelled by that negatively charged object. So the electrons will go down to the bottom. Now, this electroscope is, uh, is made with two foil leaves. So when we have a bunch of electrons in these foil leaves, they repel each other, and the leaves will spread out. Um, up at the top, because electrons moved away, we're left with a net positive charge. 
Uh, similarly, if we bring in positively charged object near the electroscope, electrons will be attracted from the bottom. And so the top will become ne negatively charged. The bottom will have a net positive charge, but still we have like charges, so it will repel. And if we bring any charged object near, we'll be able to see that because these foil leaves will repel. Um, let's talk about some methods of charging. The first is conduction, which is charging by contact or by friction. If we rub two objects to together, the electrons from one can be transferred to the other. One object then becomes negatively charged and one object becomes positively charged. For example, if you rub a balloon on your hair, the balloon gains electrons from your hair the balloon becomes negatively charged because it gained electrons and your hair becomes positively charged because it lost electrons. Opposite charges then attract. This has excess electrons. This has not enough electrons. So there's this force between your hair and the balloon, which is what causes your hair to stand up. It's charging by friction. If we have uh, if we have a conductor, charges can flow freely. So if we bring an object with a lot of charge in contact with a conductor, those charges will spread out into the conductor. And that's charging by touch, charging by conduction. Now, um, since those charges are repelling each other, they spread out. Some of them are now in the ball. Some of them are now in the rod. We get this repulsive force, which repels the ball from the rod. Another method of charging is polarization, and it's not really a method of charging, but it is a, it's the redistribution of charge within a group of particles that produces an apparent charge on a, the surface of an object. So uh, when we're polarizing an object, the net charge is still equal to zero, but some charge is in one place and the opposite charge is in a different place. So no charge is actually transferred. It's only redistributed. For example, a polar molecule is a molecule that has, well, I'll go through this example in a second, but let's talk about uh, polarization. Let's say we have an aluminum can. So aluminum is a conductor, which means electrons can freely flow through it. Now, a neutral aluminum can is full of a bunch of electrons and a bunch of protons evenly distributed. It, but if we bring a negatively charged object near it, well, it's going to repel the electrons. So our electrons are going to move to the right, and we're going to end up with a bunch of electrons over on the right. Since we lost electrons on the right, we'll have excess protons on the left. So there's more positive charge on the left, more negative charge on the right. Oh, and it's also drawing it in the PowerPoint. And actually, because of this, we can get a force between this negatively charged rod and the uh, the can. Even though the can has a net charge of zero, the positive charges are closer, so there's going to be a strong attractive force, and there's going to be a weaker repulsive force, which means the net force is going to be towards the, uh, towards the rod. So you can actually pull neutral objects if they are conductors, if you can get them polarized. Um, a polar molecule is a molecule where one side of the molecule is more positive and one side is more negative. Water is an example of a polar molecule. The oxygen side of water is more negative. The hydrogen side of water is more positive because the electrons uh, basically are in, in the oxygen uh, shell. So we have this positive side, this negative side, which means that it can be attracted to other water molecules, which is why we have hydrogen bonds because this is negative, positive, positive. And we would also have negative, negative, positive, positive. And that's important for a lot of the important uh, chemistry of water. OK, so our last method of charging is called induction. And before we talk about induction, we need to talk about this idea of grounding. Uh, you've probably heard the term electrical ground. When we ground something, we're connecting it to the earth by a wire, pipe, finger, etc., some sort of conductor so that electrons can transfer to or from the earth. 
And what this does is it neutralizes the object that you ground. The reason it works is because the Earth is huge. And it's so large that we say that it can accept or donate an infinite or an unlimited amount of electrons. So when, when our charged object is connected to the Earth, those like charges are going to try and repel. And so they're going to go into the Earth to get away from each other or come from the Earth. Um, until our object is neutral. So grounding neutralizes an object. So here's how induction works. It actually combines a few different methods of charging. So one, uh, if we start with a negatively charged rod, could also be positive, and a neutral metal sphere, represented here, if we bring our charged rod near our neutral sphere, it polarizes it. So we have positive charges attracted, negative charges repelled. Um, what we can do is we can ground the sphere by connecting it to the Earth. But we're only going to ground the side that is opposite of our metal rod. So we connect a wire right here where our negative charges are. The negative charges can then flow into the ground. Uh, but we need to make sure we're holding this rod here, otherwise um, otherwise it'll stay neutral. This Holding this negative basically pushes, uh, repels the negatives away, so it stays a little positive. Then we disconnect the ground, and we remove the rod, and we're left with a net positive charge. We can do the same thing with a negative charge if we bring a positively charged rod, or if we ground the opposite side. Uh, it's just that the direction of the electron flow might be towards the ground or away from the ground. So here's another illustration of induction. We have a neutral conductor. We bring a charged object near it. We get polarization. We ground the opposite side. Those electrons leave, disconnect the ground, and we're left with a charged object. Those are our... Um, three methods of charging. Notice with induction, our charged object did not, con uh, did not come in contact with our metal sphere that we charged up. So induction is charging without contact. In summary, electron or electric charge is a fundamental property of matter. Electrons have a minus E charge. Protons have a plus E charge. Only negative charge, that is the electrons, are transferred when charge travels. Lowercase e tells us the magnitude of the charge on a proton or electron. Coulomb's law tells us about the electric force between two charge objects. Like charges repel, opposite charges attract. Neutral objects feel no net force. Um, here's our equation for Coulomb's law. Charge cannot be created or destroyed, only transferred from one place to another. And we can charge objects using conduction, polarization, or induction. That's all for today. Bye.